Good day, everyone. My name is David Williams, Executive Director of the International Association for Energy Economics. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar entitled Gas Market Integration and Decarbonization in Southeastern and Central Eastern Europe. We are grateful to Mel Yordros and Energy Vantage for today's timely discussion. First, a little bit about the International Association for Energy Economics. We are the largest association specializing in the field of energy economics and provide a forum for the exchange of ideas, experience, and issues among professionals interested in the field. The organization produces two professional journals, a newsletter, and holds conferences and virtual presentations, along with a host of other products and services that you can find at our website at www.iaee.org. If you're not already a member of the association, we welcome you to join. A few housekeeping matters in regard to today's webinar before I hand things over to our moderator. First, this webinar is being recorded for those that cannot participate in today's live event. If you have a question for our speaker, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window and type your question. We've allocated sufficient time at the end of this webinar to address your questions. And now I would like to introduce you to our moderator, Dr. Mel Yardros, Executive Director of Energy Vantage. Mel, over to you. David, thank you very much. And let me also welcome everyone to what I hope will be a very interesting and informative discussion. By way of background, until very recently, I served uh, the International Gas Union as the Executive Director of Public Affairs. And in that role, I obviously tried to keep up with the global and regional gas developments. But at the same time, I confess that my level of knowledge and understanding of the complexities and issues more specific to some of the regions is somewhat limited. And with that in mind, I'm delighted to be joined on this webinar with Mariana Liakopoulou, who is very knowledgeable on issues relating to Southeast, Central, and Eastern Europe. Before we get to Mariana, uh, let me, and being based in Toronto, Canada, uh, and having worked in the North American gas industry for many years, I think you all know that the North American system is the most open and transparent gas market system in the world. And it is so because all of the necessary elements that work together to make the system what it is are there and well developed. Robust infrastructure, a variety of basins that are well connected to the markets, bi-directional pipelines, significant storage assets close to the consumption markets, liquid trading hubs with price transparency, and final physical and financial markets. But as with any system, it is as good as the weakest element. And that happens to be the case with New England in Northeast US coast. New England in the winter is pipeline capacity constrained. And it's not unusual that while Henry Hub is below $3, in New England, the price soars to 12 and $14. The region that we will discuss today is not only challenged from an infrastructure perspective, but in addition, you have, you have to factor in climate policies that are also impacting the availability of financing. So Mariana, welcome. Thank you again. The floor is yours. Thanks, Mel. Thanks for this uh, introduction. Let me just share my screen with you and our viewers. All right, here we go. Great. Uh, thanks, as already said, and let's kick off. So from, uh, let's start from the 1998 gas directive that first stipulated the security of supply objective in the context of interconnected European energy networks to the market model of the third energy package, basically demanding and bundling of vertically integrated undertakings third-party access, a transparent uh, tariff methodology, and a transparent network 
regulatory and supervisory institutions. And finally, the subsequent adoption of the European Union's network codes, uh, regulating application of third energy package rules in terms of existing and incremental pipeline capacity. So in this context, uh, we see that the European Union has always strived to create a well interconnected gas market with multiple entry exit zones and reverse flows, mature and liquid hubs in its less liberalized regions, namely uh, Southeastern and Central and Eastern Europe, by finalization of uh, gas infrastructure corridors, that would be north to south for Southeastern Europe and east to west for Central and Eastern Europe, as well as by the expansion of flexible short-term LNG trading, enabling market operators to balance their positions and uh, fostering inter-member state price convergence. And finally, uh, it has strived for a market characterized by enhanced uh, solidarity and regional coordination in order to attenuate the repercussions in the event of a uh, malfunction in the gas system of one or several member states on the basis of four risk groups, uh, the North Sea group, North African group, the Eastern group and the Southeastern group, each corresponding to a uh, regional gas supply source following the repeal of the 2010 security of supply regulation by the 2017 one. So this acquis on the internal gas market uh, takes an added importance once diffused uh, to membership hopefuls or simply partner countries through policy and funding initiatives in the context of the energy community, including through the Central and Southeastern Europe Energy Connectivity Initiative, as well as the Eastern Partnership Energy Panel. In short, EU gas market liberalization to date has led to regulated entities, transmission system operators, distribution system operators, uh, storage system operators, LNG operators, promoting a competitive internal market. However, um, although security and competitiveness have been the two key aspects taken into account, in the context of the European Union gas market design to date, decarbonization targets for 2030 and 2050 now compel consideration of sustainability as a uh, third key aspect. So there's a kind of uh, virtuous circle linking uh, decarbonization or low carbonization, as you wish, with affordability and security of supply. So this kind of virtuous circle is attempted to be now generated on the basis of gas market policies. Now, having said that, uh, this presentation here today aims to assess uh, the state of play in terms of conventional gas market integration in C and SCE, as well as the challenges that both regions are gonna be faced with uh, in view of the planned decarbonization of the EU gas sector. Now, uh, let us first take a uh, brief look at the market features, at the particular market features of the regions we're going to uh, be talking about today. Let's start with the problems. So the markets under uh, review are characterized by historical over-reliance on Russian gas, with the exception perhaps of Romania, uh, whose upstream sector has been uh, developed since the 1900s, um, leading to Russia covering relatively small volumes of domestic gas consumption through uh, the Trans-Balkan route since the late 1980s. Of course, Romania has its own issues with um, legacy regulations preventing exports to third countries other than EU member states. Uh, so the discussed markets also lack infrastructure interconnections to diverse gas supply sources, 
They also lack interconnectivity between markets within the respective regions, as well as with Western Europe, which is mostly the case for Central and Eastern rather than for Southeastern Europe, uh, with the exception, of course, of the, um, of the Soviet era pipeline systems. We've got the Ukraine route uh, with Brotherhood and Transbalkan pipelines and the Belarus route with Himal Europe pipeline. And finally, these markets are mostly supplied by unidirectional gas flows, that is east to west for CE and north to south for SC, and have generally limited access to LNG supplies. Exceptions here are uh, Poland with Polsk LNG uh, operated terminal, uh, Lithuania with Sklypeida FSRU, uh, Greece with its Revitus LNG terminal, uh, Turkey with two Botash. LNG storage units and a privately owned FPSO. And finally, there's also the recent case of Bulgaria, uh, that although it was supposed to be supplied from the perspective Alexandrupoli FSRU in northern Greece, it still has made its first purchases of some uh, 140 MCM of US gas from the expanded LNG terminal uh, in Rebithusa in Greece. I know, let's take a look at the policy goals that the uh, EU aspires to deliver with regard to these markets. So the EU aims for both regions' future gas demand growth to be met by at least three different gas supply sources, in line with the Central and Southeastern Europe energy connectivity framework. Uh, it wants to enhance the discussed countries' traditional transit role uh, via different and bi-directional gas flows, be it from the Caspian and Central Asia, um, uh, the US, uh, Norway, the Middle East, or elsewhere. It wants to interlink the two geographic regions uh, by promoting particular prospective uh, pipeline projects and LNG terminals, including through its lists of projects of common interest. It wants to export to these markets uh, the Northwestern European market pattern, according to which uh, price formation has transitioned from oil indexation to gas and gas competition, especially in view of uh, the expiry of long-term supply contracts. And finally, it has to start from zero in creating commercial natural gas sectors in such markets like um, Albania, Kosovo and Montenegro. Now let us take a look at where we stand in terms of the software. That is the implementation of the existing EU gas market key in CE and SE with the help of a couple of policy goals. Let mm -hmm. us start with uh, hub trading activity. That is uh, activity on trading venues with a transparent price mechanism. Uh, so far we're witnessing either negligible or zero momentum towards that direction across both regions. And this is actually uh, quite unfortunate because it is common knowledge that deviations in terms of how mature, interconnected, and competitive uh, EU gas hubs are can be the cause for price disadvantage for consumers in EU member states where uh, gas hubs have not been established yet. Uh, efforts towards strengthening hub dynamics have so far been made on the part of Bulgaria, uh, where in December 2019, operator Balkan Gas Hub launched its trading platform and uh, kick-started uh, first auctions under the gas release program. Well, as of 2020, multilateral trading has also kicked off, including a short-term segment, a long-term segment, any brokering service, uh, while implementation of clearing services is to follow. Uh, now, another development, uh, this time very important for CE, is the classification of Hungary's MGP virtual trading point as emerging from a liquid by ACER and CR in their 2019 market monitoring report, thanks to uh, price competitive transportation tariffs uh, that made it uh, appealing for enhanced gas transit flows, especially from Ukraine, as well as the timely imp implementation of the gas balancing network code. Now it is the same report 
uh, that also recognizes Ukraine's efforts towards establishing a gas trading hub as Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is a market that both produces and consumes gas volumes. Uh, it is a market that is uh, interconnected to other EU gas hubs. And finally, it is a market that has been uh, capitalizing on its vast uh, gas storage capacity, while the uh, the favorable uh, time differentials of the futures curve throughout spring and summer have stimulated storage injection. Now let's move to the uh, institutional front uh, in the annex of this section over here. You can check out the status of TSO and bundling and certification uh, in the energy community uh, with the highlight, of course, being the completion of a bundling of uh, the National Integrated Incubat Naftogaz, uh, following certification by the National Energy and Utilities Regulatory Commission of a gas transmission system operator under the independent system operator model, uh, which is applicable to companies forming part of vertically integrated undertakings prior to September 3rd, 2009, that is prior to the entry into force of the third energy package, whereby network ownership is retained within the vertical group, but operatorship is uh, subject to strict conditions. So basically, as of 2020, uh, which is part of Naftogaz group, transferred the gas transmission system operator of Ukraine to a whole new entity called Maestralne Gazaprova de Ukraine. In contrast, uh, Turkey, which is an observer to the energy community, but a country actively negotiating its accession into the EU, has established uh, an energy exchange uh, whose uh, trading volume in the spot gas market reportedly hit a record earlier this year. However, it has limited, uh, it has noted limited progress with unbundling state incumbent, botage, uh, wholesale and transport businesses. And finally, as far as member states are concerned, uh, the highlight would inevitably be the European Commission's 77 million euro fine uh, on integrated incumbent state-owned Bulgaria energy holding for blocking access to key gas transmission infrastructure. So basically, in Bulgaria, there is an ownership regime that is inconsistent with the liberalized gas market logic, whereby uh, Bulgar Gas and Bulgar Trans Gas, both Bulgaria energy holding subsidiaries, are in charge of uh, gas provision to customers and of the national gas transmission infrastructure and stole, uh, and sole gas storage facility in the country, respectively, uh, which is what basically triggered the antitrust. Um, now, as for the network codes, over here. So 2018 marked the adoption of the first set of third energy package network codes and guidelines by the energy community. Uh, the congestion management procedures guidelines seeking to mitigate contractual congestion in pipelines, gas pipelines, by returning unused capacity to the market uh, for reallocation in regular allocation processes. Uh, as well as the network code on interoperability and data exchange were the first two pieces concerning gas. But since then, transposition dates have been set for the remainder of the network codes. Moreover, we've got the 2011 regulation on market, uh, wholesale energy market uh, integrity and transparency requiring the promotion of integrity and transparency in both electricity and gas trading uh, through the detection and deterrence of market abusive practices. Um, this one is now implemented by Bosnia, however, in the field of electricity, not in the field of gas. While a pertinent decision is also expected uh, by Kosovo's Energy Regulatory Office. And finally, as far as the uh, Eastern Partnership Framework is concerned, policy highlights uh, include the early 2017 establishment of uh, Azerbaijan's Energy uh, Regulatory Agency uh, in cooperation with EBRD and the Asian Development Bank and in line with the EU model, as well as its membership uh, in the Energy Regulators Regional Association. However, the focus 
with regard to that region is placed on its LNG market potential, which is an initiative led by Poland and Ukraine since 2018, with a pertinent study launched in early 2020. So let us now move to the hardware. Uh, gas market liberalization in the discussed regions mainly depends on development of physical gas supply and interconnection infrastructures, that is pipelines, uh, LNG uh, storage assets. Uh, now, as Joseph Stiglitz had said, in developing countries, lack of infrastructure is a far more serious barrier to trade than tariffs. So let's start with the Southern Gas Corridor as our first uh, infrastructure highlight. Even though um, its contribution in terms of alleviating actual European gas demand is rather small, uh, commissioning of the Southern Gas Corridor has become um, sort of la, la raison d'être for a set of pipelines and LNG terminals, enhancing the potential for cross-border interconnectivity in Central and Eastern Europe and the Balkans. Uh, the ability of the Trans-Adriatic pipeline, in particular, to improve uh, the domestic natural gas market in the Western Balkans and to diversify supply sources along a vertical axis from Greece all the way to Hungary and perhaps uh, even Ukraine, are the reasons driving uh, TAP are the reasons that drove actually uh, TAP selection as the Southern Gas Corridor's European segment. Uh, over the much larger scale, Nabucco West, back in 2013. So these goals are to be uh, satisfied by a swaps and reverse flows, thanks to a web of pipelines, which is to be constructed to the north of TAP. Here it is important to speak a bit about the vertical gas corridor concept, uh, which has been uh, set by a set of agreements dating from 2014. Uh, between TSOs, uh, governments, and joint ventures in the broader C and SC region. Uh, so we're basically talking about a system of reverse flow interconnectors linking Hungary to Greece via Bulgaria and Romania and bringing non-Russian supplies mainly via the Trans-Adriatic pipeline, in which case we're talking about Caspian gas, and from the Perspective Alexandrupoli uh, FSRU with a um, nominal regasification and send out capacity of 5.5 BCM per annum and a peak technical regasification and send out capacity of 22.8 uh, MCM per day. In which case, we're talking about various LNG sources, including from the US. Now, North Macedonia, through the IP on the border with Bulgaria as well as Moldova and Ukraine through Isacha interconnection point on Romania's uh, Eastern Transmission Corridor could potentially also join this route. Now the three BCM per annum interconnector Greece Bulgaria, which is scalable to five BCM per annum, is the very first pipeline to work in tandem with TAP and the Alexandrupoli FSRU and can uh, nullify uh, Bulgaria's near uh, total net import dependence on Russia. Uh, here, um, it is also important to make the distinction between the interconnector uh, Bulgaria-Serbia with a throughput capacity of 1.8 BCM per annum, a European Commission project of common interest um, that under the Central and Southeastern uh, Europe Energy Connectivity High Level Group that was also recently funded with 28 million euros under connecting Europe facility. And on the other hand, the 400 kilometer 13.88 BCM per annum gas trans pipeline, which is the downstream extension of a new pipeline, which is to be built in Northern Bulgaria and which in its turn is going to connect Turk stream. Now, um, the latter uh, applied in 2018 to the Serbian regulator for its exemption from third energy package provisions, including unbundling, third party access, and tariff regulation. And in its uh, 2019 opinion on the regulator's decision, the Energy Community Secretariat concluded that it is indispensable to amend the conditions for exemption from third party access by significantly lowering the exempted capacity 
as Aris in its uh, initial decision had reserved 88% or more of the capacity for Gazprom and state monopoly Serbia gas, thus strengthening the role of two already dominant players in the Serbian market and harming competition across the Bulgaria, Serbia, Hungary nexus. Now, uh, speaking of Turk stream, with flows from Ukraine to Bulgaria, Greece and Turkey falling by over 95% as a result of the commissioning of this uh, Black Sea corridor by Gazprom. I think now it's, uh, it, it's a, it is the right time to uh, start considering uh, testing reverse flows of the Transbalkan pipeline route. Uh, for example, Moldova recently exported some 1.6 MCM to Ukraine for the first time, uh, while uh, physical delivery of minor gas volumes was also tested between Greece and Ukraine, although the prices have not been uh, very attractive. Now, getting to the gasification of Western Balkans, in particular, the bidirectional 5 BCM per annum Ionian Adriatic pipeline uh, is going to Europeanize and gasify energy consumption profiles of Albania, Montenegro, Bosnia, and Croatia. However, tariff and uh, cost recovery challenges have so far stemmed the establishment of a dedicated consortium. And at the same time, we also have the perspective 2.6 PCM Kirk LNG terminal on the homonymous Croatian island that is basically going to offer complementary supply options for EAPS off-takers, activating the pipeline's north-south flow feature and boosting viability of both projects. Now, uh, a compressor enabling firm export flows on the now bidirectional uh, Croatia-Hungary border point, whose finalization was announced by the Croatian TSO in early 2020, is going to play an important part once uh, Kirk LNG becomes operational. Now, going further north northwards, uh, the currently executed Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, Austria pipeline is going to fill in the interconnection gap between Romania and Central Europe. Uh, in 2019, as we know, there was an ASTRA decision that compelled Hungary to continue the uh, Hungary Austria part of project that includes finalization of the pertinent interconnection point between the two countries after performance of an economic test. Uh, up to that point, the Hungarian TSO wanted to divert the project route uh, through Slovakia, citing economic feasibility concerns. However, the number one issue for this project right now is its resource base. One option, one theoretical option, in my opinion, would be to link it to the prospective second leg of the Transcaspian gas pipeline, the White Stream pipeline through the Black Sea. However, this sounds uh, highly improbable at this stage. So what's left is Romania's indigenous oil and gas resources, which have been troubled by national legislation. Um, as a result, no shippers would commit to using uh, BRUA capacity without guarantees of new Black Sea output, while upstreamers, including the likes of Exxon, are unlikely to progress with their uh, Black Sea pro projects without guarantees of future export capacity. Now, a new draft law on this issue that is to be submitted to the new parliament following the December 6th election is believed that uh, it is going to give a glimpse of hope to the business circles involved. Now, further northwards, aside from LNG import terminals in uh, Poland and Croatia, the region is trying to gain access to non-Russian supplies through the Baltic pipe from Norway, and is also working on new interconnections like the Commission Baltic connector between Finland and Estonia, the under construction gas interconnector Poland-Lithuania, and the expansion of the Ukraine-Poland gas interconnector. And finally, looking further east, important projects spotted are the recently completed uh, EU-funded gas transmission network on Ungenichinsina route, representing the second stage of the EAC Ungenichinsina interconnection project, allowing Moldova to access up to 1.5 
PCM for animal vertical gas corridor supplies, as well as Georgia's prospective gas storage facilities. However, uh, as already said, regional cooperation under the Eastern Partnership actively evolves around LNG. And you can see a summary of applicable options regarding LNG market development in each of the partner countries in this table uh, over here. Uh, so as a comment, uh, indeed, LNG project sanctions in the regions might stir up uh, competition and liquidity as long as access mechanisms facilitate fair utilization of the capacity by various market participants. However, we also have to bear in mind that as oil indexation and firm offtake agreements uh, fade into history, LNG project economics are exposed to largely uh, volatile spot prices. And let us now take a look at the status of the decarbonization of the EU gas sector by means of a sort of light regulation uh, governing green gases and implications for C and SC. Now, uh, geographically, even completion of conventional gas market integration and regulation for an electron driven future are going to form integral parts of the EU gas supply security architecture on the road towards the envisioned carbon neutrality of the 2050s. Now for European gas to sustain its flexibility in the thick of decarbonization, a cross sectoral market and system approach involving both electricity and gas transmission infrastructures is going to be needed. And this is basically what the concept of sector coupling is all about. Uh, unabated natural gas demand is projected to fluctuate around the threshold of minus plus 400 BCM in 2030, depending on overall EU economic project, natural gas price competitiveness versus renewables in the power sector, as well as on the market shares that uh, renewables and electricity storage are going to hold by that time. Uh, now, under ENSO scenarios consistent with the Paris Agreement, gas demand in 2050 is forecast to fall to 410 BCM, comprising exclusively uh, green gases, uh, that is biomethane and renewable sourced hydrogen, while unabated gas is projected to have fallen to zero by that time. Uh, now, in line with this rationale, existing EU gas infrastructure could safely accommodate it, unabated gas, by 2030, while uh, after 2030, it could be retrofitted to transport either biomethane or hydrogen admixtures uh, over long distances by means of interconnectors, as well as to manage renewables temporal nature, uh, satisfying demand by means of storage facilities. As soon as uh, power to gas becomes available at network scale, um, the very same gas infrastructures could transport or store renewable electricity in its gasified form, either to be used as such or to be reconverted into electricity by a gas-fired power plants. Now, of course, um, adaptation of the existing uh, gas market regulation for the decarbonization of the EU gas sector is going to prove a tricky task in absence of a mature and uniform uh, European green gas industry. I mean, uh, after all, issues like vertical integration, um, oil indexation, they became causes for concern within an EU gas market whose establishment largely predated the drafting of pertinent regulation. Still, the EU is going to pursue this goal through a set of uh, regulatory steps shown in the table uh, over here. And where do we stand? In July 2020, the European Commission released its hydrogen strategy. Uh, you can see which issues this document does and does not address. Perhaps we could elaborate a bit during the Q&A section if you wish so. And let us now try to incorporate C and SE in this EU uh, decarbonization agenda. 
So the EU has to strengthen its position as a norm and standard setter on energy transition in these regions, while also keeping in mind the asynchronous levels of integration within its own energy market, as well as in the market of its partner countries. Now, to further uh, frame this theoretically in line with Euro Europeanization studies, uh, energy could be considered one such policy field uh, where integration is harder to be achieved uniformly due to diverging uh, national interests across member states and in our case across membership hopefuls and partner countries of the European Union. Uh, therefore, it is first and foremost essential for the discussed markets to finalize their conventional gas market integration, striving for liquidity, competition and price integration, even if the gas market decarbonization key is to marginally change uh, the broader market landscape. For example, as the EU has to guarantee access for green gases to its gas infrastructure, Completion of unbundling, as the majority of TSOs are still part of vertically integrated companies and have opted only for functional unbundling, far-reaching implementation of third-party access and competition, especially in poorly liberalized and isolated markets in CE and SC, are all vital. Why? In order to ensure a level playing field for firms involved in the decarbonizing gas market. Um, Needless to say that these markets have already benefited from conforming to this EU gas market key. Uh, Open-ended supply diversification, equally supported by the LNG GLAD, have led to the basic gas exporter to the region, Russia's Gazprom, reconsidered its historical legacy of market strategies. How? By introducing spot indexation of numerous LTCs, uh, by exporting LNG via gas auctions and direct sales on its electronic sales platform for deliveries to virtual trading points and interconnection points in Western Europe and Central and Eastern Europe, and of course via abstention from uh, contract destination clauses following litigation. Now, finally, it should be highlighted that transposition of the of the gas decarbonization key must not fragment individual uh, European markets as their re-adaptation would require uh, time. Now, for instance, with regard to hydrogen blending in existing natural gas networks, the European Commission's hydrogen strategy cautions that blending changes the quality of the gas consumed in Europe and may therefore risk fragmenting the internal market if neighboring member states accept different levels of blending and cross-border flows are hindered. Now, policy developments on the decarbonization front include uh, the revision of the objectives of the Central and Southeastern Europe Energy Connectivity Initiative that now, aside from market integration and security of supply, also include a green post-COVID-19 recovery. It is indicative that following the seventh uh, ministerial video conference, it was stated that challenges and opportunities related to the decarbonization of the gas sector will be assessed jointly with the International Energy Agency and the Fuel Cells and Hydrogen Joint Undertaking. Now, the EU hydrogen strategy uh, explicitly refers to the energy community contracting parties, while the Secretariat has also uh, encouraged contracting parties to take methane emissions into account in terms of the business operations of their national natural gas industries. And last but not least, there are uh, funding initiatives oriented towards green gas projects in the region. For example, uh, we've got EBRD's assistant towards Georgia in exploring its green gas, uh, excuse me, its renewable sourced hydrogen production potential, uh, as well as in upgrading Georgia's existing natural gas assets for the transport of blending hydrogen to uh, end users. Now to conclude, C and SC are on a path towards gas market integration, mostly helped by new infrastructure investments to the north of the southern gas corridor and LNG supplies uh, from the Baltic Sea. Uh, the small size and modest consumption profiles of the discussed countries 
uh, have so far prevented them from noting quick progress. Uh, here, of course, uh, we have to accept the Romanian market, the nearly self-sufficient Romanian market that has, of course, uh, its own uh, troubling national legislation to battle with. Uh, moreover, both regions lack TSOs operating large asset bases with the exception of the Ukrainian market. Therefore, new interconnectors and LNG terminals have to be built uh, and supplied to a large extent by third countries, be it the US, Norway, Caspian and Central Asia, or the Middle East. In this respect, the EU has to support these regions both uh, politically and financially. Now, prior to aligning their national legislation with a sort of uh, light green gas regulation, these countries need to finalize infrastructure along the North-South corridor. They need to properly implement existing gas market software. And finally, they need to seamlessly depoliticize their external gas relations leaving zero room for monopolistic trading practices as a short-term step by the mid-2030s. At the same time, they have to continuously uh, advocate natural gas as a suitable substitution versus more polluting options like coal, and to gradually replace unabated gas with green gases as a medium to long-term step by the 2050s. Now, uh, preconditions for a smooth transposition of the gas decarbonization key include integration of infrastructure investments with policies to enable uniform sector coupling, and of course, a version of national market fragmentations. And that was pretty much it for me. Mel, back to you. Yeah. 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 So let me just stop sharing my screen. There we go. Oh, I've lost everybody. Uh, am I there? Hello. Well, I can see you and hear you. We can hear you. Okay. Okay. I can't. Unfortunately, I can't see anything. So, so something happened. But let's uh, continue. Uh, Marianne, thank you very much. Uh, uh, incredibly detailed uh, overview of the complexities, and I say the complexities because it is a bit overwhelming when you consider all the actors, uh, the governments that are involved, the overall EU policy, and it all comes together um, in this region. Uh, it is very complex. I'd like to also say that, you know, you did show a couple of uh, 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 charts um, that go out to 2050. I just wanna remind everybody that those are not forecasts. That is a scenario. Uh, of what potentially could happen under the assumptions that were uh, taken to create that scenario. Uh, so there's a big difference between a forecast and a scenario because you have to really understand the elements that go into uh, the scenario to produce that the outcome that, that has been produced. So that's just sort of a, uh, a point that I'd like to, to make, out, uh, make, make, make fairly clear. No different than the IA uh, scenarios, for example, they're all scenarios and they all depend on certain policy direction and certain uh, things to happen in order to, to project what might happen under each scenario. Now, let me just sort of uh, uh, step back a little bit uh, and, and, and begin to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, perhaps you can uh, sort of elaborate a little bit uh, uh, on the supply side, uh, I'm just wondering if you could elaborate on potentially other sources of supply uh, to the region and where they might uh, might come from. Well, yeah, um, uh, speaking about other sources of supply other than LNG, because as said, we currently have uh, two prospective uh, LNG terminals in southeastern Europe, uh, one in Greece and one in Croatia. And there are two um, LNG terminals, LNG terminal in FSRU in operation in further northwards in Poland and Lithuania. So there we can talk about uh, US supplies, we can talk about Qatari supplies, we can talk about Algerian supplies. Uh, especially in 
in, in terms of southeastern uh, European supply. Um, however, I think that the big issue uh, regarding third supplier countries into the European Union uh, is going to come by the Southern Gas Corridor. Because um, as you know, there's the um, uh, commercial operation, the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline expected uh, by mid-November uh, uh, this year. So uh, TAP's second phase forces expansion of its initial capacity by an extra 10 BCM uh, via two additional uh, compressors. Uh, expansion, of course, is contingent on the interest that is going to be expressed throughout the booking phase of market tests at an auction that are equally open to TAP shareholders and third parties. So as we know, uh, TAP has launched a market test since uh, July 2019, whose first non-binding phase concluded with a public consultation on a draft project proposal in line with capacity location mechanisms network code. However, the pandemic's blow to the global energy markets has pushed the second uh, bidding, uh, binding bidding phase to mid-2021. Uh, also, as we know, both the South Caucasus pipeline and the Trans-Anatolian pipeline, which are the two other segments, the two other Eastern segments of the Southern Gas Corridor are scalable to 31 BCM per annum. So their capacities can be extended as well. Now, the whole Southern Gas Corridor pipe network is a rather expensive uh, midstream project. Therefore, it is in the interest of investing consortia to have pipelines operating at their full capacities. And this is going to also bring costs down for the shippers because right now shipping costs are quite high. So this in turn is going to give uh, all these companies and investors the impetus to invest in upstream projects, to take final investment decisions about upstream projects in the Caspian Sea Basin. Now, um, the so-called next wave of Azeri gas is, in my opinion, the most uh, likely candidate for this phase two of the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline. Um, however, it has to be borne in mind that uh, ramp-ups of further uncontracted gas volumes from Azerbaijani structures like uh, Umid, uh, Babek, uh, Buladenis, uh, Karabakh are not uh, expected before uh, 2023, 20, uh, from which year onwards, uh, Azerbaijani natural gas production is projected to peak to about 50 BCM per annum by uh, 2029 20, approximately. And now, the second option for uh, this uh, additional capacity of the Southern Gas Corridor uh, is of course Turkmenistan, uh, but there, th this is a more distant option, I would say, especially, um, well, we also, we have the 2015 commissioning of the East-West Pipeline, which basically links Galkinish gas field and other eastern gas fields in onshore Turkmenistan to Turkmenistan's Caspian coast. However, the problem with Turkmenistan is its present uh, natural gas transport regime that basically uh, forces buyers to assume all risks beyond the Turkmen border. And that uh, involves construction of pipelines. And we need an additional pipeline infrastructure subsea uh, transcaspian gas pipeline in order to say that we have a potential uh, second supplier to the southern gas corridor other than Azerbaijan. Now uh, other options like uh, Kurdistani gas or Iranian gas are in my opinion unviable at the moment. They're, they're not options. And also uh, there is no option of uh, Russia uh, taking this extra 10, 10 BCM capacity of TAP for the uh, open season because uh, Gazprom has, uh, at the end of the day, opted for the South Stream light option as its continuation of the Turk Stream uh, natural gas project. So there is no option to pass it through Greece anymore. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question in, and I'll 
we're, I'm going to pivot a little bit. But before I do that, I, I'll just make some remarks because it's it's very relevant to to the next question. At the International Gas Union, for years now, we've uh, we've always advocated uh, for unbiased uh, support of technology and innovation. Uh, our position was always don't pick winners and losers. Um, you never know when the big breakthrough is going to come through. Um, and as Dan Jurgen, uh, in his recent uh, book, uh, calls out, uh, he says, you know, shale gas was the biggest, uh, most recent uh, technology innovation that has occurred that has really uh, turned the world upside down in terms of uh, energy. Um, so that's always been our, our position. And you can see uh, without the advent of uh, FSRUs, without the advent of small scale LNG, um, some of these options wouldn't be available uh, and would make things much more difficult from a supply diversification perspective. Uh, I'm not sure how many people understand that there's over a million truck LNG deliveries in China every year. Um, so infrastructure can be bypassed through small scale LNG and small scale deliveries of LNG. Uh, and it's really a very promising uh, technology and innovation that has uh, made that happen. So the question it really relates to the EU's recently released hydrogen strategy. And just wonder if you have any thoughts on how that hydrogen strategy uh, may play out in this region and the implications of that strategy to the development of the market in this region. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, actually, there was, uh, there was this table in my presentation um, outlining issues that uh, this strategy does and does not address. Um, so let's see, uh, let's take them sort of one by one. Uh, so this strategy um, does not touch upon the applicability or the possibility for amendment of and battling rules, but that's highlight the need for the uh, development of non-discriminatory uh, third-party access in order to reduce undue burden for market access. Now, um, using existing natural gas infrastructure in Europe for accommodation of green gases, including hydrogen, renewable sourced hydrogen and low carbon hydrogen, that is hydrogen produced from natural gas with carbon capture utilization and storage, uh, is going to bring greater attention to the role that network operators are going to, are going to play in this new reality. Now, uh, what is in battling? And battling basically prevents TSOs from being involved in production and supply activities at the same time. Now, in terms of uh, DSOs and battling, there's uh, greater flexibility over there because DSOs can still be incorporated into vertically integrated companies under uh, certain conditions. So clarifications are needed uh, in terms of whether activities like, let's say, electrons to molecules conversion can be considered production activities or uh, hydrogen storage can be considered a trading activity if hydrogen is then destined for re-electrification. Now, unless rules change anytime soon, the commission could initially grant derogations to network operators for small scale and demonstration projects. But after the end of this transitional period, I think it is vital for uh, network operators not to take advantage of their position in terms of ownership or operatorship of installations like uh, power to gas conversion plants, for example, 
unless NRAs verify that there truly is no other or there are no other market-based investment options over the horizon uh, in accordance with the market failure concept. Now, uh, besides, in lack of a mature hydrogen market with uh, extensive networks, over-regulation of early uh, competitive activities, including through the introduction of such rules like third party access seems um, slightly, slightly irrelevant, I would say. Now, another thing discussed uh, by the strategy has to do with the guarantees uh, of origin on the basis of provisions set by the Recast Renewable Energy Directive, uh, which is part of the Clean Energy for All Europeans package. Uh, and well, the directive basically focuses on biomethane and renewable sourced hydrogen. It does not cover low carbon hydrogen, that is hydrogen produced in natural gas at all. Still, um, support certification schemes like guarantees of origin uh, are required for policies uh, remunerating consumption of green gases. So this is an important aspect broached by the strategy. And finally, um, it is the same uh, recast directive on renewables that could, that could furnish the basis for a sort of um, regulation governing hydrogen tariffs. Now, the higher the level of tariffs, the more likely it is to uh, provoke a sort of chain reaction involving subdued demand and scarce network um, operator revenues. So it is important uh, for market participants, including hydrogen investors among them, to sort of have a, a clear picture, like a holistic view of the whole system price signals, including alignment needs between electricity and gas grid tariffs. So these are like uh, the four the four issues now, because you asked me about this region, the particular region that we're examining today. Well, as long as um, we come up, as, you, as long as Europe comes up with a coherent policy in terms of applying existing gas market, the key to the incorporation of green gases, then this region will have to follow suit. And after finalizing its conventional gas market integration, it will have to uh, move on with the adoption of the additional policies. So now we are to the hour. So uh, uh, I'm gonna put you on the spot. I'm gonna ask you for uh, uh, a 30 second response uh, okay. on, on something that I mentioned uh, in my introductory remarks. From your perspective, looking at this region, what is the weakest element that is uh, uh, prohibiting the development of, of the market in the region? One, not two, so I'm putting you on the spot. You got 30 seconds. Okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be quick. Well, uh, weakest point, um, in my opinion, must, not all of them, but uh, most of these countries, especially when it comes to the Western Balkans, are not EU member states. So they're not obliged to abide by any rules. Now, um, their obligation to abide by these rules, by the internal gas markets rules, came a lot later, um, a bit after the 2000s. So it's still very premature to speak about uh, transposition of the internal gas market rules to this region. So I think that it's because they came in a lot later that we have to talk about them and that we have to comment on their progress right now. If they were member like, states from the very beginning, maybe we'd, we would have a different discussion right now. So it sounds a bit like that. Uh, well, listen, I want to thank you very much. Uh, it was uh, uh, an excellent presentation. Thank you uh, uh, for sharing your thoughts uh, and your details around uh, all of the complex issues in this region. Uh, and with that, I, I want to turn it back to, uh, to David.
Thank you. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Mariana. I mean, wow, what a this is this is an ongoing fascinating topic, particularly for me, you know, something that IAEE has developed within the last uh, 10 years is our Eurasian conference uh, theme. And uh, the topics, Mariana, that you touched base on today are, 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 are very critical and are certainly ongoing, uh, particularly within the region. So uh, I welcome you to get involved with that uh, particular product of, of IAEEs for sure. For those that are listening, this has been recorded. It will be available on our Rewind. We do encourage you to let your friends and colleagues know it will be posted this afternoon. As always, we encourage you to join the association. Visit us at www.iae.org. Thank you for attending, and I officially close this webinar.